All right, if you will find your place in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Once you've found your place, please stand out of the reverence for reading God's Word. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And we're going to begin reading in verse 4. We're going to read through verse 14. Philippians chapter 4. All right. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and how to, how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that she did communicate with, with my affliction. Let's pray. Lord, I do thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that this is not a dead book. Lord, this is not a, a, a book of good sayings, of good teachings. Lord, that uh, you're not just another uh, good, good teacher that came along one day and, and taught us things to give us the feel-goods, Lord. But, Lord, you came that you might change our lives. Lord, I thank you so much, Lord, the fact that you not only cared enough to come, but you cared enough to leave your word for us, Lord, so that we know how much you do love us. Lord, and I do thank you for your word, and I thank you for what you've done for us. And I pray that this evening as we study in your word, Lord, that we would see just another facet of how you, uh, Lord, how you desire to be effective in our lives. Lord, I, uh, in your name I pray, amen. amen. Philippians chapter 4, if you're writing down the title, I titled this, Calm in Spite the Chaos. Um, Paul was writing this letter from, uh, from a time where he was under house arrest. He was awaiting his trial before uh, Caesar. This was during the time, uh, during AD 61. This was just a few years prior to the, to the really hard times that were going to come for Christians around AD 64 when Nero was going to go absolutely crazy and was going to start putting Christians into the Roman Colosseum and where there was going to be great, great distress within the Christian family. But that didn't mean that it didn't start earlier. This was still a tough time. This was just before Nero really got up and rolling. However, being a Christian was still a, was still a hard thing to be because as the Roman government, if you were a Christian, you weren't going to bow down to Caesar. You weren't going to say Caesar is, is curios, which means you know Caesar is Lord. You weren't going to bow down to him. And trust me, that didn't sit well with the Roman government. If you were a Jew and you'd become a Christian, you were, you were disowned by your family. And the fact was, it wasn't even just simply a disownment. There was in some cases where the family would actually desire to harm or kill you. All you got to do is look over in the Middle East today. If you become a Christian out of, any, out of say, even Muslims, they're, they're not just going to desire that you go away from the family. They're going to desire to kill you. Right. You know, this, it was a dangerous thing to be a Christian. You could be a Greek Christian, and it was dangerous because you were disowning the, you were disowning the, Roman, uh, the Roman values. You could have been a Jewish Christian, and you were in trouble because you were disowning your Jewish values. In either case, it was a tough spot to be a Christian. You know, Paul wasn't speaking to a group of people who knew nothing about personal loss and tragedy. He wasn't writing to these people just saying, guys, I know you don't have a full understanding of this yet, but eventually it'll come, and this is how you can have calm, and this is how you can be peace, even despite these problems that are going to come. 
That's not who he was writing to. He was writing to people currently in problems, currently going through loss, not just loss of family members through death, but loss of family members through disownment. You know, it's, it, it's a terrible thing to lose a family member. It's a whole other thing for a family member to be alive, and yet you, can't, you have no fellowship with them. You know, I don't know if you have any family members like that, but I have. And you've got people that, you know, you just, you have nothing to do with them, and they don't really have anything to do with you. You know, the, these were coming to people who were going through times and troubles, but yet he still expected them to be a people at peace. You know, how is that possible? How could Paul expect such a, such a thing of people to tell them, look guys, I know you're going through some awful circumstances and I understand that your lives are absolutely in turmoil, but be at peace. How could he expect that out of them? You know, when tragedies unfold, you can always see the reactions are differing completely between people. You looked at the, uh, if you watched any of the news reports of the Boston Marathon bombing, as you watched the immediate explosion, you saw two re reactions. You saw people that ran away from the blast in utter fear, and you saw people who ran into the blast still in utter fear. But two different reactions in the very same moment. One person had two choices, and people made different choices throughout that entire explosion. And nobody could be blamed for them running from them. Nobody says that you are a coward for running from them. But yet there was people who ran towards the explosion. Right. You know, you see two different responses in a time of tragedy. You know, you have people who panic and people who have purpose. In one picture, you see people running, and the other, you see people running towards it. It's not that the explosion did not panic the first responders. It's just the explosion incited them to do more than just panic. It incited them to action. Amen. You know, they were running, but they were running to the right thing. Life is full of personal tragedies. And you know, just like whenever a bomb goes off, when an explosion of any sort goes off, immediately there's a time of death, there's a time of blindness, there's a time of discomfort, probably pain from the shock wave, and there's all kinds of things that sweep over your body. And in that moment, the decision, the next decision you make is a decision that's based off of predetermined ideas. It's based off of training. You know, a police officer runs into that situation because he's been trained to do it. A firefighter runs into the fire that he's deathly afraid of because he's been trained to do it. A military soldier runs into a firefight with bombs dropping and bullets flying because he's been trained to do it. And as a Christian, we too can be trained to have peace in a time of panic. That's what Paul was trying to get across. You can be going through a time when everything's falling apart, but that doesn't mean you have to be falling apart. Paul was trying to get this across to them. And, and it obviously was something Paul was personal to. It's not that Paul was speaking out of, uh, speaking out of a you know, book he'd read. And he said, guys, I read this book about having peace, and it was pretty good. You guys ought to read it. I'm going to talk to you about it. No, Paul was living this out. And in our lives, we're, our lives are full of personal tragedies and loss that is not always newsworthy, but yet still has a great impact on our lives. You know, we're not promised a life without loss, but we can be promised a life without fear of that loss. Paul had every right to panic during the writing of this letter. Nobody would have been ashamed to be afraid because Paul, to be honest, he was awaiting his execution. As far as he knew, there was no, no reason for him to go back. His job was completed. His, his great goal was given by God to go to Caesar and to bring Christ to Caesar. He, he knew that was his utter goal. That was his end. And he was sitting there, and instead of being panicked and feared, he was writing a letter telling everyone how not to be in panic and how not to fear. There was no earthly reason for Paul to be as calm as he was, but that's exactly what Paul was trying to teach to them. He was trying to teach them how they can have peace where chaos reigns. Paul wasn't peddling some feel-good words. He wasn't peddling out the story about a, a good feely story so that everyone could feel good about it and then they'd get over it. Paul was teaching something that was going to be proven in his own life. He said, guys, not only am I going to teach you how to have peace through chaos, but watch me. Watch me as I do it. If, you, if I can do it, you can. He was trying to teach us through chapter 4 how we can be calm despite the chaos. So first of all, how can we be calm despite the chaos? You know, every one of us has something that's marked our lives that has personally strongly affected us. And I'll have to say that this, uh, for me, this sermon came out of my own personal life. 
you know, this is, I've been studying this for, for quite a while, and I just figured, hey, if I'm studying it, I, I, I might as well have an outline out of it. But I've been studying it myself, because to be honest, I, I've been going through some stuff that's really been, you know, really been not settling well with me. And I've, I've been looking at Philippians 4 a lot, trying to understand, Paul, how did you have peace? You know, what I'm going through has nothing in comparison to what Paul went through. How did he have peace? And here we can look in verses 4 through 14 and we can see how Paul had peace. Paul had peace, first of all, we see the pathway to peace described in verses 4 through 9. The pathway to peace. The pathway is found by, first of all, resting in the Lord. He tells us that it's found by resting in the Lord in verses 4 through 5. In verse 4 he tells us, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. You know, this is a song that we sing as kids, you know, rejoice in the Lord always, again I say rejoice. You know, it's a song that we sing in school, we sing it in, uh, sing it in the kids' choir, and, you know, it's got a really nice beat to it, and it sounds really good and gets you excited, and, and little do you know he was writing this as he was awaiting his execution. You know, you start singing that song and it doesn't have quite the same, have quite the same meaning to it. It's kind of like that pocket full of posy song you'd sing. You know, ashes to ashes we all fall down and we're all talking about the Black Plague. <laughs> yeah, it's not so cute when you put it in perspective. You know, the song was born out of a man that was waiting execution. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. This was not a man who was sitting there panicked in fear, not knowing what was next. He said, guys, I know what's next. I already know what's coming. And guess what? If you'll read some of uh, Paul's earlier letters, he, you know, he wrote saying, Hey, guys, I'm in a strait. I'm betwixt two, having right. desire to depart and to be with God, which is far better. But it's more needful for me to be here with you. Paul said, Guys, that needful time has passed. I'm not in a strait anymore. I know where I'm going next. But I tell you what, I'm going to tell you how you can have peace when you're in that time. Paul was writing to them and telling them how they could have rest in the Lord. He tells us that they are to rejoice. The word rejoice there means calmness of mind. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever struggled with any kind of anxiety of sorts, your mind doesn't, seems to have a power all its own. It seems to be fully in control, and it seems like it's hard to regain control of it, especially when you, when you let your mind think on things that don't, uh, that don't have any good purpose to it, that, that incites you to fear. It can become a steamroller effect. It can just plow right over you, and it doesn't seem like you can find a way to stop it. He says, how do you stop it? You have calmness of mind. He said, it's not just a rejoicing like, okay, guys, I'm happy. Nothing's going wrong. Just look at my smile. See how happy I am? He's, no, it wasn't. He, he's not talking about an outside thing at all, actually. He wasn't talking about outside singing and dancing and having a great attitude about life. He's talking about having calmness of your mind. You know, you can, you can read all kinds of self-help books. You can take medication. And there's plenty of people that have ser spent their whole lives to gain one thing, that's calmness of mind, and they still have not achieved it. No amount of alcohol has ever done it for them. No drug has ever done it for them. It does it for a moment, and then the low comes afterwards. No pill has ever done it for them. No counselor has ever given it to them. That's why we have so many counseling places popping up everywhere, because people are looking for one thing, calmness of mind. And Paul says, guess what? I've already got it. Let me tell you how to get it. He tells them to rejoice. You know, we should not be as those that fear as if there is no hope at all. You know, we can go through periods of loss and feel like there's no hope. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 15 makes it clear. He says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of, uh, of bondage again unto fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. He said, we, we don't have the spirit of fear within us. If you allow fear to become a controlling aspect in you, it's not because it's coming from the spirit that God's given you. It's because you're giving control back to the devil who used to own you. And trust me, there's nobody in here that's preaching to you more than I'm preaching to myself. You know, I, you know like I said, this, this sermon was really born out of personal experience. You know, I, I, like I said, it's just uh, this past year has been, been interesting with some changes that have taken place. And... Uh, without trying to make it too personal, I'll be honest, uh, the passing of Brother Gary was, was something that really strongly affected me. And, and it's, uh, you know, the, this past year, it was, it was really hard to come out of that and sit there and see what took place. And I'll be honest, I understand that the Word tells you that these things are going to take place. 
But when you lose somebody that's a friend of yours and you see people hurting, it's a hard thing. And, I, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm young in the Lord and I, uh, I just hadn't gone through it before, I guess, and I don't want to become good at it. I know pastors uh, buried many people throughout the years, but for me that, was, uh, that, that shook me pretty hard. And, uh, and I guess it should if it was a friend, but it, it shook me extremely hard. And, you know, Philippians chapter 4 has really been a text that has really been working, that I've been working in my heart personally. Because, you know, he's saying we don't have that spirit of fear. We weren't given that. If you've allowed the spirit of fear to take back over in your life, it's because you've given your life back to the devil again who used to own you. He said we can call him Abba, Father. We don't have that spirit of fear. We should be calm. He tells us that calm should be impressed upon our conscience and the fact that we are to rejoice and have calmness of mind. He tells us that calm should be expressed in your countenance. We see that in verse 5. It's not just in our mind, but it should be on our faces. In verse 5 he says, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. The word moderation there is the word that means gentleness of spirit. He said not only should you have a calmness of mind, but your spirit should just exude that gentleness. Amen. It should be all over you. That's, you know, that's why there should be a difference when something terrible is going on. You know, if, so, if you have a calmness of mind and a gentleness of spirit, do you understand what kind of, what kind of person you can be to someone who's hurting? All, you know, having one person walk into a room that's in absolute chaos and come in in calmness and grab you by the hand and take your hand and tell you, I'm praying for you. The kind of calmness that it can bring to a room. That's the kind of spirit that a Christian should exude, a calmness of mind and should have a gentleness of spirit. We shouldn't faint as if there's no hope. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 says, But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. He said, we don't sorrow as those that have no hope. We have hope. We were given hope the day that we got saved, and there's no reason for us to let that go. If we allow our hope to be lost, it's because we've given it up, not because we don't have it. God's given it to us. He, said, uh, he tells us that in 1 Thessalonians. So as we're looking here, we see letter A, that as we're finding the pathway of peace, how do we find it? We find it by resting in the Lord. We find it, letter B, by praying to the Lord in verses 6 through 7. Paul makes it clear that we are not to be anxious. The word there is careful. He says, be careful for nothing. But if you look at the term of the word, you find the definition, it basically means don't be anxious. That, you know, that, that verse alone, you know, is one that really I've been, I try, I've worked hard to memorize that and to work hard on that. Be anxious for nothing. He says to be not, not to allow anything to take control of you. He said we can achieve that because he, he tells us to pray about everything. You know, how can we achieve that in a world in which it's full of fear? There's plenty of things to be scared about in this world. There's plenty of things to be scared about in your own personal lives. How can you achieve not being anxious. Well, you achieve that by praying about everything. In verse 6, he says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. He says, Fear nothing. The word nothing there means not even one man, woman, or thing. Does that cover everything? He said, be anxious about nothing. Don't be anxious about a woman. Don't be anxious about a man. And don't be anxious about a thing. I think Paul did a pretty good job of encompassing everything when he said that. So don't let people make you nervous. Don't let events make you nervous. Don't let things in your life make you nervous. How do you not make, let them make you nervous? You pray about everything. He says that we are in verse uh, second part of verse 6. He says, but, uh, uh, by prayer, I'm sorry, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So he says, petition God about everything. There's never something going on in your life that's so insignificant that the Lord doesn't care about it. You know, we fool ourselves in thinking that, oh, the Lord doesn't care about that. Well, I'll just, I'll take care of that. The Lord, you know, I don't have to worry the Lord with that. There's nothing that you're worrying the Lord with. In fact, you're worrying yourself by not bringing it to the Lord. He tells us that we're to petition God about everything. And when we do pray about everything, we can have, in verse 7, peace through anything. 
In verse 7, he tells us, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He tells us we can have peace through anything. The word passeth is the, it gives the idea of to excel or to be superior to. He said that our peace is superior. It's a superior peace. It's superior to all intellect. He said, guess what? Your peace is better than any person's best advice they can give you. It's better than the wisest person that has gone to school and gotten two PhDs in counseling and in psychology. He said, it's better than all this world can explain and offer to you. He said, we have a peace that excels, that's superior to every other thing in the world. He said, it's a shielding peace. His peace will protect us. He said, it'll keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The word keep there implies the idea of a guard. It implies the idea of a sentinel standing outside of you, standing there at guard, guarding over you and continuing to give you peace. He said it's a shielding peace. It will shield our heart and it will shield our mind. You know, our heart is the basis for feelings and our mind is the basis of our intellect. He said if we pray to God, then He sets out a sentinel guarding us, protecting our minds and protecting our hearts and giving us peace. You know, there's plenty of things in this world that is trying its hardest to break down that door. It's trying its hardest to get inside because when you don't have peace and when you're living in fear and you're not calm, how effective are you for Christ? You're zero. You get nothing done. You achieve nothing. You don't stretch anything. You don't step out in faith because you don't have faith because you're living in fear. You can't take that next step that God's asking you to take. Why? Because you're scared. You can't tell that person about Christ. Why? Because you're fearful. If, this, if the devil can move that sentinel and can take away that protection and remove that peace, then you're not of any use to the gospel anymore. So we see in the fact that he sets a sentinel, he sets a guard over our mind and over our heart. So we can have peace by praying to the Lord, but we can also have peace by meditating on the Lord. In verses 8 through 9, he tells us to meditate on Him. He says in verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. He gives us the things that we're to ponder. How are you going to fill your mind with stuff to keep your mind from worrying? He said, this is what you're going to fill it with. Fill it with truth. True, the word true there is pretty simple. Fill it with truthfulness, honesty, reality, genuineness. He tells us to think on honesty. He tells us that we are to be of serious, of good character, honorable, worthy, respectful. He tells us that we are to think on things that are just. In other words, conforming to the standard or conforming to the will of God. We're to think on things that are pure. They're holy, chaste, innocent. We're to think on things that are lovely. They're pleasant. And we're to think on things that have a good report or a good reputation among them. You know, it's, when you're going through a time of panic, the hardest thing to do is to stop that steamroller of worry. He says, how do you stop it? You throw up a barricade. You throw up a barricade of truth, of honesty, of just, of pure thoughts, of lovely thoughts, of good rapport. He said, when you want to know what's going to take that place, what's going to keep you from being panicked, move your mind to these things. You know, it's really easy to worry about something when that's all you're thinking about. You know, it's amazing when you're trying not to think about something, what's the number one thing you're thinking of? <laughs> If I was to say in this room right now, I don't want any of you guys to think about the color white. Okay, what are you thinking about? You're thinking about the color white. You know, there's mind games that you can actually play with people over that very same thing. Try not to think of white. Okay, don't think of white. Now what are you thinking of? And that, that's the only thing in your mind. It's all you can picture is white. He said that when you want to meditate on the Lord, how do you do it? You remove those thoughts and you put your thoughts on, things of, uh, on the things of God. He tells us to ponder the right things. Second of all, he tells us to practice the right things in verse 9. He says, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So he tells us to practice the right things. We're to learn from the right people. We're to mimic the right people. He said, how are you going to learn these things? He said, by mimicking me. He said, you've seen me. You've heard me teach on this. You've seen me live it out. Now do it. 
So how, how do you have that peace? You have it by meditating on the Lord, by pondering on the right things, by, by practicing the right things, by having the right follower, by following the right leader. So as we're trying to understand how we can be calm in spite of the chaos, we see first of all the pathway to peace is found in verses 4 through 9. But in verses 10 through 14, we see the product of peace. The product of peace. Peace produces gratitude toward the Lord. We see that in verses 10, through 10 and 14. In verse 10, he tells us, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Verse 14, he says, Notwithstanding, you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. He said that it, our, the product of peace will be, uh, will be gratitude towards the Lord. We'll, we'll be thankful for the supply that God's given us. You know, Paul said that I've learned both to have everything and to have nothing. I've learned to suffer need and to go, go, with, go with excess. He said, I've learned to go through all of these things, but most of all, he learned to be grateful no matter what he's been given. He was thankful for the supply. Paul understood the truth of James chapter 117 where he says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He said, No matter what comes my way, I understand the source of that gift. And it made him grateful. It made him grateful for the supply that he'd been given, but it made him grateful to all people. Paul made it a point to thank those who had taken care of his needs. You know, our country really has become a country that's of very little gratitude. And, I, and it's become so little in the fact that it's very rare to find someone say thank you, even when you do something out of the way. I, I know at my work, they, you know, the one big thing that they've been tr uh, pressing, and it sounds such a simple thing, but to say thank you to every customer at the dealership. And you know, it seems like such a big deal because you'll have three people say thank you to someone and by the third time someone said thank you, the person say, man, this place is awesome. Everybody keeps saying thank you. And we've even had surveys come in, people saying that, and it's all over thank you. Just literally two words. Just one person saying thank you has wow. become such a rare event that when people hear it, they go, wow, there's something different. You know, imagine if a Christian is to become a person that is always thankful how different that makes things. You know, if Paul were here today, he'd come through and he was getting ready to leave and you put a check in his hand to make sure Paul was taken care of, I guarantee you Paul would have been one of those guys that when next week's mail came, there'd been a thank you note. How do I know that? <laughs> this is his thank you note. He wrote it saying, thank you. You took care of my needs. Thank you. So how do we have peace? How, what, are, what is our product of peace? It's gratitude, not only towards the Lord and His supply, but the people who God uses in our lives. We'll be thankful for all people. He tells us also that we'll, um, that we'll have contentment from the Lord. So one of, our, uh, one of the benefits we'll see is gratitude toward the Lord, but second of all, we'll see contentment from the Lord. In verses 11 through 13, we'll see that contentment is a learned state in verses 11 through 12. He tells us a learned state. He said, not that, I, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And he uses the word learned a few times in just these few verses. He's, in verse 9, Paul uses the word learned and says that if we practice what we've learned, then, God, then the God of peace will be with us. Verse 11, he tells us that he has learned to be satisfied. In verse 12, he has been instructed on being satisfied. So he tells us many different ways. I, it's a learned thing. It's not something that just comes to you. You're not just born with the ability to be content. How do you know that? Look at a baby. Very rarely are they content. They either got too much sleep, they didn't get enough sleep, they got too much to eat, they didn't get enough to eat, they're getting too much of your attention or not enough attention. There's no contentment within a baby. There's just very few times where a baby just sits there and just, uh, and it's just sitting there, and you know, it's, you know it's a big deal because parents take pictures of those moments because they're so rare and few <laughs> that they take a picture and they have to record it. Oh, hon, it's not doing anything, and it's awake. Take a picture. You know, it's that rare. And it, it's something we have to learn. We have to learn to be content. And Paul said that I've learned to be content. He, we'll see here in the way that we learn is we learn by God's experiences in our own lives. 
the, lear the word learn there means to learn by experience. The experiences that God allows us to live out through our lives are for our instruction. You know, in Romans, uh, Romans 8, verses 28 through 29, the Bible says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and them who are called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. You know, we, we hear that text used a lot. But that's exactly what Paul was trying to get across, is the fact that our situations are a learning tool. They can be good. If you love God, you're called according to His purpose, and you're willing to learn. Every situation can be used for good. So he uses the word learn there and the fact that we're to learn our experiences. The Lord permits adverse circumstances into our lives, and we have a choice. We can either react in self-pity and accomplish nothing, or we can respond with the attitude of learning and gain a deeper relationship with Christ. You know, whenever a tragedy hits, you always have two choices as a Christian. It will either draw you closer to God or it will push you further away. And that's pretty much it. When a tragedy takes place, no one stays the same. You know, you, you can probably tell me a story of something in your life that's taken place in your life and you'll admit today you are not the same because of that moment. And it had two effects. It either pushed you to God or it pushed you away from God, but the choice was yours. There's no event that can change your relationship with God. It's all within you to make that choice. And we have to learn from those experiences. And it can create a deeper relationship with Christ that we've never had before. So we can, letter A there, learn by God's experiences in our lives. And we can also learn by God's teaching in our lives. The word instructed found in verse 12 means to learn the secret of. So through the Christian life, our life should be growing in deeper knowledge and experience and learning the secret of God, learning the secret of peace with God. So we see that contentment is a learned state. It does not come natural. Paul made it very clear, I've learned in whatsoever state I am. He says that I've learned a few times throughout this section. So Paul's making it very clear. It's something that has to be gained. He said, I've learned, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. So we have to learn by God's experiences in our lives. We have to learn by God's teaching in our lives. But also contentment is not dependent on circumstances. Contentment has no dependence on circumstances. Paul had learned that inward happiness is not dependent upon outward circumstances. Satisfaction has nothing to do with circumstances. You know, you can meet someone who just barely has enough to eat. And I tell you what, you can meet that person that's absolutely happy as could be. They love life. They're enjoying it. But they're glad they have enough to eat. You can meet someone that has everything that the world has to offer and it's never enough. You know, you meet a person that's absolutely wealthy beyond means. Some of the most successful men and women in America, the reason they're successful is because enough is never enough. And you know, that sounds great as a sales pitch, but to be honest, that goes into their inner fiber. It goes down into their core. Enough is never enough. They're never content. Nothing is ever good enough until you have more, more, more. And as a Christian, we have to realize that contentment is not dependent on our circumstances. Content, the word content means to be satisfied. You know, as a child, we're, learned, we, we're taught to be satisfied with what you've give, been given. It happens every night at dinner. <laughs> that plate gets in front of you, but I want this. Well, that's what you're eating. Be satisfied with it or don't eat. And our parents tried our hardest to work it into us. If you know me, you know it didn't work <laughs> because I wasn't a very good eater and I'm still not. Uh, you know, my parents used to say, well, you'll just go to bed hungry. And I said, okay, <laughs> that's fine with me. I'm on a diet tonight, I guess. But, um, you know, content means to be satisfied. So we see that satisfaction has nothing to do with circumstances. And satisfaction's secret is resting in the power of God. We find that in verse 13. He says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. He says that it's our strength. The word strength there means to be empowered. You know, how are you able to stand as the world crumbles around you? If you don't have anything to worry about, that's fine. Turn on the TV and watch some news. They'll give you plenty to be worried about. Hey, you don't have anything to worry about? Okay, let's watch the news tonight and learn about natural disasters. It could be you. 
you know, we can you can watch shows on the Weather Channel when they don't have enough good weather to report on. They actually have shows that warn you about weather that could happen. It's really interesting. Don't worry about the weather. There's not enough to worry about. So great, let's make a whole show about how your city could be destroyed by a volcanic activity. You know, if you've, if you've seen the show, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous to think about that. But, you know, just watch the news. There's natural disasters. There's acts of terror. There's corruption in our government. There's plenty of things in this world that all you've got to do is click on news channel, whatever, and you can have a reason to have your faith shaken. There's also personal trials. You could be going through health issues, family issues, loss of a loved one, a change in your career, and all these things could be shaking you down to your core. You could be going through p uh, fear in, in this time. Your emotions could feel like they've got absolute control over you. But as Paul stated in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Paul made it clear that regardless of our, uh, of our life circumstances, despite the chaos that surrounds us, we can have a comfort in the fact that the Lord is still on the throne and that as Romans chapter 8 verse 37 says, Amen. He's made us more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Amen. You know, we can look at the life of Paul and think, boy, he sure is a great Bible character. But try to make it a little more personal. Try to understand if you were Paul, how would you be dealing with the circumstances? How would you be doing it? You know, as I sat there and like I said, I, this, you know, this past year for me is... It, it, you know, and I know everyone's, I'm not saying mine is any more important by any means. I'm just telling you I'm, I'm in me. I only know how to relate to my own experience at the time. The past year, you know, it, it, that's been something that's really been hard. And, and, you know, I sat there and I've been reading this thinking, Paul, how did you do it? You know, Paul had entire continent of Asia say, we're done with you. You know, you think it's hard to minister to one person, invest your life in them, and then walk away. Imagine a whole continent. Paul said, all of Asia has gone away from me. You know, you could have invested yourself in someone that you care about, and they, they walked away. And you're sitting there thinking, Lord, how can I continue despite this pain, this loss? Paul said, I've been there, guys. Check out all the badges. <laughs> i got a bunch of them. And if I had peace, I can tell you how to have peace, too. Paul gave us the road to peace. And again, I don't, I don't know what's going on in your lives, and I don't know if this sermon was meant for anyone other than me. Might not have been. I know Pastor said that before, and honestly, I've never felt that way more than I have now. Maybe this sermon was just for me. I don't know. But, you know, maybe there's something going on in your life right now that you just don't know how to continue on. It feels like it's absolutely controlling every moment, every thought, every emotion, and you just don't know where to go from here. Paul said, You can have calm despite the chaos. As Miss Stephanie comes to play, I want to invite you, if the Lord's worked on anything on your heart, maybe, you know, like I said, I don't know how the Lord's worked on you. I know how He's worked.